Freeman. Thank you for joining me today. Hello, Kara. I'm glad to be here. Yeah. Can you introduce yourself to the INFORMS membership? Yes, I am uh, Freeman Marvin, uh, and I am a, a longtime INFORMS member and currently serve as the instructor for the CAP certification prep course that INFORMS teaches. Okay. And how long is a long time INFORMS member? I was you know? trying to calculate that. It's been at least 26 years. Okay. So that. That falls into our longtime member category, you're correct. Um, you also work at Innovative Decisions. That's Inc., correct. That correct. Yes, we've now, we're now inter, uh, Innovative Decisions International. Oh. We were, we're a wholly owned subsidiary of the ITA Corporation. Okay, great. Um, can you talk about how you got into this field and how you ended up at IDI? Well, yes, I. Uh, had served in the Army for five years um, after gra having graduated from the U.S. Military Academy at West Point and um, got a master's degree at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. And it was there that I was introduced to decision analysis. And so I really thought this was uh, fascinating. And uh, when I left Harvard, I went to a, a company that specialized in uh, decision analysis. And there I sort of branched out into other uh, methodologies and areas of OR and analytics. Uh, so I've been working in this field sort of ever since uh, probably um, 1984, or something Great. like that. So it's Good. been a while. Great. And how do you define analytics? I know Informs has their, their own definition. What's yours? Yes. Well, I was I recently read um, uh, the uh, president of Informs, the new president, um, and his sort of revised definition, and I thought it was really good. They had the word decision making in there, so it was uh, exactly how I think of uh, all of OR and analytics. It's not about the model building, which is mm -hmm. important, but it's about uh, helping an organization and its leadership make good decisions. So uh, that would be um, about as simple as it gets, but it's all encompassing. Uh, that's what it's all about. Yeah, thank you. Can you talk a little bit about any work you're doing now, any recent projects you've been involved with? Um, so recently I've been, um, helping a government client uh, with a number of smaller projects involving mostly decision analysis, but also simulation. And uh, I've been uh, fortunate to work with some good government clients and um, it's very satisfying to help them um, you know, make decisions. These are mid-level managers who often don't get a lot of professional help um, so it's been, uh, it, that's been a, a great, uh, a great time to do that. So no momentous decisions there, but this is helping them get their job done every day. And uh, so that's what, you know, that's really the bread and butter of uh, OR is really making a difference at the, I guess, the micro level or the mm -hmm. mid level. Uh, very few projects, um, you know, sort of take years and years and uh, you know have huge multi-million dollar impacts. Most of it is just blocking and tackling and improving the organization a little bit at a time. Great. So you have earned the CAP, which is our Certified Analytics Professional uh, designation. Yes. Um, you're also closely involved in helping others becoming CAPs by facilitating the CAP prep course. Yes. So first, can you tell us why you decided to become a CAP? Well, uh, you know, everybody approaches OR and analytics or comes from it uh, from a different background. So we have our profession has people with degrees in all sorts of areas, most of them having some level of quantitative work. But there's no place in the your education, your schoolhouse time that you spend that you really focus on this 
one area or in analytics. Even if you become um, a graduate of you know one of these um, uh, analytics master's programs that are out now, you're mm -hmm. only really getting a slice of it, and you're not getting um, the practical aspect of working with clients, getting um, a project up and running, finishing it, uh, taking it to completion. So the CAP program really is focused around how you successfully run a complete analytics project. And so, as I said before, the, the model building is, you know, it's an important part, but it's just a, almost a tiny part. The big, one of the biggest areas that a lot of people have trouble uh, with when they um, start their career is the people part. You're working with all sorts of people from the client to stakeholders, subject matter experts, and they're the ones that you really need to learn how to relate with and, and to communicate with. Uh, and but building the model, yes, you can, you can go to school for that. And, but the CAP um, program is really, and the CAP certification is really a, a um, challenging for a lot of people because they don't get a chance uh, to learn about the people side Right. of analytics. So I enjoy that. The, the soft skills part portion, that, right? That's right. And, um, we, you know, we only started using that word soft skills um, maybe uh, 10 years ago. Um, and suddenly everybody says, well, yeah, you really know how to build models, but boy, his soft skills aren't very good. You're like, oh, okay. Well, you hear that word term all the time now. Yeah. And uh, so I was uh, able to uh, work with some colleagues uh, a few years ago, and we started teaching the soft skills workshop at the uh, analytics conference every year. And mm -hmm. uh, to prove very popular, and I think we, we made a lot of um, good impact on, on the OR and, and on informs. Um, so just curious, did you become a CAP before you started um, facilitating the prep course, I assume? Yes. Or were you involved with CAP and then decided you should go ahead and take the test? Uh, no, I was actually one of the early members of the job task analysis. Okay. And then I think I earned my CAP in 2014. So I was okay. one of the first grads yeah. for the CAP. Okay. Um, can you briefly describe the CAP prep course and why those interested in becoming a CAP should attend it? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So the CAP um, it, uh, certification, of course, has five different aspects. You have to have experience, certain level of experience, certain education, uh, sign an ethics statement and a um, certificate from your supervisor that you have a basic understanding and um experience in applying the soft skills. Um, and then that final piece is the CAP exam, which mm -hmm. is a hundred questions in three hours. And it's not easy. The format of the exam is very straightforward for uh, multiple choice responses for each question, but they come from such a broad area. I mean, this, our profession is, is enormous. So, uh, people come with uh, experience in a, one area. For example, I'm a decision analyst. I've done that a, a long time. But mm -hmm. I had to acquire other skills like optimization or um, predictive analytics. And so what the CAP does is looking for a T-shaped expert. And informs means by that somebody that knows a bit about everything across the board so they can really help orient uh, the client on what kind of model and what kind of project would best uh, support them and uh, solve their business problem. And so that it's really gratifying to, to be able to teach people who may be experts in certain areas that we call okay. those I-shaped I experts, but um, to be a T-shaped expert is not easy because it's like you know, trying to become a, a dentist and a lawyer and a plumber all at the same time. So 
uh, that's what's been fun. And I, uh, hopefully I've um, tried to be a real mentor to a lot of people who are working on their cap. And our success rate has been very good. We, we've uh, got over 75% of um, folks who've taken the course have um, achieved their, their cap certif certification. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, that um, goes nicely into my next question, actually. Um, curious in what ways you've seen the CAP certification influence and shape the careers of other professionals, either um, some of your peers or if you've seen emerging talent come up? Yeah, well, absolutely. Oh, my, mo my, you know, most experience is with my own company. And so we, early on, we were, um, we had the most CAP um, certifications of any company except IBM. So that was pretty good for a small company. Yeah. And what I found with that is that we had some young analysts who were, you know, first coming into the profession and they got so much out of the study process of preparing for the cap. So they were able to grow and mature uh, in areas which they had really no experience at before. Um, but because we had a program to, um, to share uh, knowledge and experience because we had you know, people with lots of different backgrounds. Um, we, were able to, we were able to watch those, um, those younger analysts uh, grow into more than just you know, a, a predictive analytics person or, or an optimization or simulation person. And that was good. And I've seen uh, from time to time, some of the other students that have taken the CAP prep course have kept in touch with me and um, they're doing uh, they're doing really well. So I'm, I'm pleased. Um, okay, so with your history as um, an enlisted career officer and the legacy of analytics and OR in the military, why do you think the knowledge demonstrated in a CAP is critical to success? And should CAP be considered the standard required certification within these types of jobs? Yeah, so a officer is different than an enlisted man, so or enlisted person. So it's a in, oh. the, in the military, you're either enlisted or you're officer. You're not enlisted officer. Okay. Um, so with that, um, I will say that you know the skills um, that uh, you need in the military are even if you're not building a specific OR model they're all very similar. And that is being able to listen, good listening skills, understand what the problem is, develop an approach and execute it. And that is the, exactly the same thing that we do uh, in analytics when we're building a model and starting to try to help our, um, our clients to solve a business problem. And of course the entire field of OR and analytics was started in the military uh, in World War II. That's the mm -hmm. origin of uh, yep. operations research. The Brits call it operational research. Yes. And so uh, the um, applications uh, within military are, you know, sort of always preceded in the, um, the uh, commercial world or the industrial world. Uh, so very, very applicable. And I, although I didn't not do operations research when I was in the army, there's a very uh, active uh, military uh, OR community. Mm -hmm. And of course the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California is the sort of, you call the, the home of military OR. Mm -hmm. and, and then of course, uh, the Military Operations Research Society, MORS, right. is sort of our, our companion organization. And uh, they, they're terrific and they do a, a, you know, a lot of good work for the government side versus the um, commercial side. Right. So besides CAP, you are also involved in other informs communities like the Decision Analysis Society and um, win forms, the, that's the Washington chapter. Yes. Uh -huh. um, how has your involvement in these communities affected your career or your personal life in any way? Well, um, uh, Decision Analysis Society is sort of my home base. All my homies are there. Yeah. So um, <laughs> I, I always enjoy the time that we can get together. And of course there's a um, companion 
bridge the group to, to that, which is called the um, Society of Decision Professionals, SDP. It grew out of the, the old DAG conference decision analysis affinity group that for years was held sort of at the same time as, uh, as the analytics conference. So you, um, sort of, you sort of went from one party to another mm -hmm. <laughs> in the same weekend. Yeah. Um, and then uh, several other you know, professional organizations uh, are, are along sort of related to that. Um, so I've enjoyed the community there and you know, contributing to that as much as I can. Um, and I think the um, the uh, other other communities that um, I've been involved with, as I've been with Informs more, had been the continuing education, of course, mm -hmm. and the practice committee, um, which Alan Butler leads now, yeah. um, which is really um, tries to uh, get the practitioners to be as influential in the organization as the academics. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's always a, um, I guess a challenge for both communities to really understand each other where they're coming from. But I think Informs has found a really good balance between the two. It was a, always a grand experiment to combine both the, um, the um, OR and the MS community um, right. years ago, but we, we overcame that hurdle. Now we're trying to combine operations research and analytics, yep. which is a challenge as well. And mm -hmm. so we're, but I think Informs has done a really good job of facing that head on. And, uh, you know, as you can tell, the, the, the CAP program has been successful and, well, you know, we can only go forward from here. Yeah, it's good to hear. I'm glad you, you think that Informs is doing a good job bringing the practitioners together with the academics and then, like you said, blending OR and analytics. So yeah. it is a challenge, but I'm glad people notice. <laughs> yeah. um, can you talk a little bit about how the COVID-19 pandemic has affected your last year, well, either professionally or otherwise? Yeah, well, like everybody, it's it's been a challenging year and a half here. Yeah. Um, I think the, you know, our my work, kind of carried on um, because uh, a lot of the projects I did were in government um, buildings. And of course the government here in the Washington DC area was, uh, you know, took all the precautions and so on. And uh, for projects where I could work from home, I got used to the virtual world like everybody mm -hmm. else. Yeah. And, uh, you know, had a lot of insights from that. I never, worked remotely in that way before. Um, but it, because of my background, what really struck me about um, the uh, collaborative, you know, virtual environment was that although all these platforms like Zoom and Microsoft Teams and WebEx, they all call themselves collaboration platforms. And the reason is because, you know, you can turn on your computer, you can see somebody else's face, you can talk, you can have a meeting, but it's a terrible way to collaborate. And so one of the things I realized, is having sat through Zoom meetings for the last year and a half, mm -hmm. is that this, uh, this uh, new normal, I guess you could say, really needs some additional work uh, to make virtual meetings more collaborative and use all the tools that we would use in a face-to-face -face meeting for facilitating good decision-making. Um, those are not embedded in the platforms today. And I think I know why, because these platforms were not built by mm -hmm. operations research analysts. They were built by computer programmers. Yeah. And, you know, even if you can get a computer programmer just to, to talk to you or to look you in the eye, um, they, they don't have the background or experience at running meetings, right? They're all about, hey, it's great. We can show pictures of people. We can, you know, put them at a stadium and haul them sitting next to each other. Well, that is no way to collaborate. So they have for years mistaken the word um, collaboration 
to mean communication, online mm -hmm. chatting, um, all that. That is no way communication or collaboration. So I, I feel I really kind of discovered that all over again and have, um, have vowed that before I leave this earth, I've got to make sure that these collaboration platforms are really fostering and encouraging collaboration. So is that your next project? You're going <laughs> to enhance our it Zoom be, and Yes, teams? when re when retirement comes, maybe that's my uh, my retirement uh, passion. Yes. All right, sounds good. So you said you're a decision analyst at heart. So is there a simple life choice that can use analytics to make uh, the best decision? Well, no. No uh, life choices are simple. So. I know, that's true. But <laughs> they, just maybe even just an everyday yes, choice. Yes. Uh, but the yeah. good thing about decision analysis is that the problem does not have to be simple, and it can be complex, and it can involve the the actual people who are being affected by it. Because you know some of the other tools that we have in OR and analytics um, are really focused on the math. They're sort of mathematical. So, you know, if optimization, you're, you're going to, it's going to, an um, optimization model will tell you what the, you know, what the maximum is or what the minimum is, what the best way to go there is. But every decision maker is different. And so um, an optimization model, it doesn't care who the decision maker is, right? It just tells you the answer. Mm -hmm. But if you build a decision analysis model, you're taking into account the decision makers, a particular decision makers, uh, risk tolerance, right? How much are you willing to gamble or take a risk, uh, take a, a face uncertainties? Because all hard decisions have uncertainties. Mm -hmm. uh, and then also takes into account the decision makers' preferences. So, hey, I might care about maximizing this thing, but I also want to minimize this other thing. How do I do that? How do I make those trade-offs? And that's why we need decision analysis and more decision analysts, because we want to make sure that the world isn't taken over by computer programmers or <laughs> optimizers. Right. And uh, in fact, I just heard uh, something recently about how um, Amazon uh, is working to optimize your entire life. Hmm. And that's great, only everybody is different. And an optimization for one person will not be this, as good of a solution for another person. So they go hand in hand. And again, that's, uh, that's what is uh, good about our professions. We do have these variety of techniques. We just have to have people who are smart enough to, you know, not apply them all the time. You know, we, we don't want to be uh, that problem of, of um, everything looks like a, a nail because you have a hammer, right? So we don't want to do that. Thank you. So if you could travel anywhere in the world right now safely, where would you go? <laughs> the beach. <laughs> the beach. Which oh, you have a favorite? Oh, oh, any beach. Well, I, I do like... Um, the uh, the sea and the and the beach better than the mountains or that mm -hmm. sort of experience, but um, my wife and I took did our honeymoon in Italy and we have not been back yet since. So I'd really like it to go to Italy and more than just because it's a wonderful, beautiful place, good food, and good wine. Mm -hmm. um, but I realized that a number of uh, OR and analytics professionals were Italian. And I didn't really think about that much before. I usually think of the French Pascal and, and a lot of the, the Brits, the British. Um, but one of my favorites that I've rediscovered is Alfredo Pareto, um, who I like to call Fredo Pareto. And he spent, a, he was an economist, but he spent his whole career um, supporting decision makers. And he came up with uh, three things which we use in OR, the um, Pareto principle, which is we know better as the 80-20 uh, rule, right? We use that all the time in life, sometimes inappropriately. 
and uh, what else? Oh, the Pareto chart, which is used across the world in industry to track um, defects in manufacturing. And then the uh, Pareto efficient frontier, which we use to make uh, good portfolio decisions that don't necessarily involve risk, but it helps you visualize and trade off uh, cost versus benefit for for you know portfolio type problems. And uh, so he was the original um, developer or the inventor of the Pareto efficient frontier. So, and there's others <laughs> I could go on, but I kind of like to go to Italy and kind of know more about those original um, OR people. Cool. So you would go to Italy and eat good food, drink good wine, and learn more about Pareto. And that's right. Dri dri that's right. Drive my wife crazy. Yeah. Speaking of your wife, if she was sitting here with us, what would she tell us about you? How would she describe you? Yeah. Well, she's uh, she's very discerning, but she's also um, uh, uh, very much of a, a person who um, is, um, you know, quiet about that kind of kind of thing. But I would say she um, probably would say that I read too much, and I guess that goes with not paying enough attention to the family. Okay. But um, uh, that's probably the biggest thing. And then uh, I guess because I do. I, I'm guilty of reading a lot. I sometimes try out new things that I've discovered on my family and um, <laughs> they call them Freeman's fun facts. Oh no, here's another Freeman <laughs> fun fact. So um, that I know that they, that they think of that when they think of me. Yeah, that's funny. Um, so what is one thing about 2020 that is maybe positive and you hope it remains in the future? I know it's not Zoom and Teams yeah. collaborations. Is there anything from the past year that you hope sticks well, around? I, I mean, I think for me and maybe for lots of people, the the thing that we all realized is what things, you know, that are, what is important in life, I mm -hmm. guess. Um, and um, I didn't have any tragedies with my my family or friends in this pandemic, but I know some people have. But it, it just raises the um, the thought that you know what's really important is uh, our family first, then our friends, and uh, then our community, whether it's local or the nation or the world. Even I mean, there's a lot of challenges out there um, that uh, is you know more important than some of the you know little jobs that we might do as professionals. So thinking about how we can apply our, our experience, our, our tools, our, um, our thinking to some of these um, problems, large and small, but that have a real impact. That I think is, you know, getting back to what's important is I guess how I would say it. And so I hope other people have learned that. I know I, I, have, learned, I have readjusted <laughs> what is important and what's not. Yes, well said, thank you. That's all I have for you today. Thanks so much for your time, I appreciate yeah, well, it. Yeah, well, you're uh, very welcome. Happy to, to be here.